The world is ever changing and sometimes we just need a helping hand. Hey, it's one more about the Rama. New apps here, new tech there. It's all very exciting, but it's nice to have something you can count on. Like insurance from State Farm. ¿Tienes preguntas sobre tu seguro? Con State Farm puedes llamar a tu agente o conectar con ellos. Aprende más en es.statefarm.com. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hello and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone, Roland Butcher is back today as the podcast cricketing expert to discuss England's Red Bull misery in the Caribbean. Thanks for rejoining me on the Paddock and the Pavilion, Roland. Stephen, always a great pleasure and looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you again. In episode 101, you said you expected a balanced test series. Uh, you said it was going to be exciting and interesting and two, two to one either way. Yes, I did. Um, I, I always felt that there was not a great deal between the two sides. I thought both teams had their deficiencies, uh, particularly in the batting department. Um, I felt both teams were capable of winning a game or, or two each. Um, at that point, I predicted, I, I could not predict who was going to be the winner because I felt it was too close. But I did. what I did think was that the margin of victory would only be by, by one. And um, I got there in the end, didn't get the 2-1, the but um, the one, and um, obviously it came up to the best it is. Well, as a commentator for the first two matches, uh, before we focus on a few of the key issues, what did you think of England's Red Bull reset? Well, it was brave. Um, I think perhaps... Um, a bit of a knee-jerk reaction after the Ashes defeat, where you know people were calling for heads and, um, and major changes. Um, I think probably um, underestimation of the challenge of beating the West Indies in the West Indies, which really, you know, if you thought about it, should not have been the case because if England had checked their records. You know, they would have noticed that I think the last time they won in this region was 2004. And previous to that, it was a very, very long time ago. So their record really in the region in the Caribbean is not great. So to believe that you can make it changes to a test setup and and come and beat West Indies and beat them easily, uh, I think was a, a overestimation of what England thought was possible. Yeah, you're right about the, the Caribbean. England have actually only won three times in the Caribbean since they first went there in 1930. Yeah, I think it's, it's almost 54 years since they've had one, one victory, um, which, is, which is quite unbelievable. And that is something really that they should have known. That's not something that I had to tell them. Um, part of your preparation um, when you're playing against a team is to know you know to know the history of between the two teams to know the history of the grounds how the games panned out to also know who performed um, in those games what type of players performed what type of bowlers um, etc etc so all of that background information should have been done um, before you know the selection uh, but it is what it is and um, things turned out not the way England would have liked. Well, you said in episode 101 that although you thought Broad and Anderson will will continue to thrive in the UK, you only thought that one of them would go. And was it a mistake not taking at least one of those two players? I made a mistake. I think one of them should have come. Um, I think, to be quite honest, um, didn't matter which one, Anderson or Broad. Um, I think they would have done an equally good job. Um, If I had a preference, I think I probably would have gone for Broad uh, because, you know, Anderson hasn't had great success in the Caribbean either. And at least Broad has a little bit more pace. And what England was really lacking in the series uh, was pace, particularly after 
the injury to Mark Wood. So I think Broad would have complimented the new players in the team making their debuts, certainly on the ball in front. And he would have been, with his experience, I think would have been a great asset um, to England, particularly in that last test match when it was much more bowler friendly um, at the start for, for faster bowlers. Well, I wanted to start by talking about the pitches. Now, you should be quite familiar to these, but were they were the pitches in Antigua and Barbados conducive to promoting test cricket? What I would say about those two pitches, for me, I, I, I don't think they were good test match pitches. And, and the reason for that is, I'll well, start with the first test match in Antigua. Very, very flat. Um, wasn't good for fast bowlers, wasn't good for slow bowlers. In actual fact, it, it wasn't good for stroke making. I think batsmen could stay in and have no difficulty in staying in, but to actually play um, attractive cricket, it was not easy. So it really was a war of attrition um, in that test match. At, at times, it was quite boring because, I mean, there was one day in particular where West Indies batted all day and scored 160 runs and, in the entire day. And really not a good advert for, for test cricket. So if, I thought the pitch needed to have a little bit more spice in it to make it a much more even contest between bat and ball. And then you, I think we would have seen, you know, a very good first test match. Uh, moving to Barbados, now we would have expected certainly to see conditions that are similar to when they last played here, which would have been good pace and bounce, but also allowing the batsmen to play their shots. Uh, what we saw was uh, a pitch that was flat where, you know, 500 played 400 or whatever, which was, again, very, very difficult for the bowlers, fast and slow, um, to get anything out of the pitch. And I think in those two matches, I think within those two matches, they were like, you know, I think West Indies scored, England scored a 1,300 plus runs and, and West Indies over 1,000 runs in those two test matches. So not easy for the, the bowlers. It was extremely difficult. I'm not sure whether the supporters would have enjoyed um, those two test matches. I think the England supporters obviously enjoyed being in the Caribbean. We're from England in the cold, um, you know, at test cricket again, you know, being able to be free, didn't have to wear any masks. Um, and just let themselves go. So perhaps um, it wouldn't have made a lot of difference. But I think if these matches were played when you've had plenty of test cricket and people were into the game, I think people would have got a little bit bored in those first two test matches. Yeah, because the West Indies bowling attack has got some pace about it. They don't really suit, the wickets don't really suit their bowling, do they? Well, no, they were too flat. You know, those first two pitches, there were no sideways movement. Very little swing, if any. No turn for the spinners. Not what I would term a, a, as a, a good test match pitch. Um, I'm not saying it was a bad pitch. It, it was a very good pitch for the batsmen because you know they were able to get individual good individual scores. But I think what it did do is actually mass um, the lack of batting ability, really. Um, on both sides because you know when you move on to the pitch where there's a bit of sideways movement and a bit of swing and then both teams really at times were fine wanting um, in terms of coping with those conditions so they may have been happy I guess for those first two pitches the batsmen but I think generally um, it would have been a much more interesting series if all three pitches were pitches where both bat and ball were very much in the game. But you're talking about the two batting sides, but did the West Indies not over the three matches, particularly the third match, prove more disciplined and resilient? Yes, I mean, the West Indies were disciplined and resilient in that third game. But, you know, in a low-scoring game and you win by 10 wickets, it also tells you that as well as you playing well, um, the opposition also has played quite poorly. I think West Indies 
struck first by winning the toss. I think it was a good toss to win. Um, Ball extremely well. England didn't bat that well in the first innings. And, and then we saw what was going to happen during the rest of the game, where like after 40 overs, everything just stopped. I mean, the ball was soft. There was no movement. Um, and batsmen could actually stay in. And, and as the game went, you saw that, you know, the, Eng the England player, the, the last player, put on a, a, a total that kept England in the game and then really had them in front of the game, in actual fact, once they got that first innings total. Because West Indies then found themselves in the same situation, even though England bowled poorly at the start of the innings. So really, I mean, the, the, if there was ever the waste of a new ball, England did that in that first innings. I mean, the ball wide, batsmen didn't have to play. On a pitch that you you got to realise that, you know, as I said, 30, 40 overs, you know, things changed, which meant that the, the tail enders uh, were actually the hardest guys to get out because nothing was happening um, with the ball on both sides and the tail enders flourished. But England ball extremely poor um, in the in the first innings, but then they had the West Indies in a, in, a, in a position that really, you know, they could have bowled the West Indies out. But again, the lower order managed to scrape a, a very, very good lead. And um, once they got that lead, if West Indies bowled well at the beginning, you know, England were going to be hard pressed to win the game. And that's how it turned out. And another very, very poor batting effort. Um, in the second innings. Just looking at the two batting batting sides, how impressed were you with Craig Braithwaite with his 11-hour 160 um, and the centuries by Bonner, Blackwood and De Silva in the last test? Yeah, I think Craig's, Craig Braithwaite's monumental effort in Barbados um, was commendable. I mean, his powers of concentration for that period of time, never went, uh, albeit, as I said, on a good wicket. And, um, you know, Craig is a person that values his wicket. He doesn't give it away at the best of times. So in conditions that favour him and, and you don't have the type of bowlers to worry him, he's going to concentrate for a long period of time. And that's what he did. So it was an excellent innings. In, in Antigua, Blackwood's, um, sorry, Bonner's innings in Antigua was a very good one um, because he really held the innings together um, and played exceptionally well. So that was a good knock. And then obviously he has, you know, good good innings on both sides in, in Barbados. Stokes got 100, Root got 100. And, and then obviously for West Indies, we saw Blackwood as well as Craig Graphics, monumental effort. So, you know, those two, those three actually um, batted really well on good batting conditions. And, and obviously Johnny Bairstow got a very good 100 in, in Antigua. Again, he was the pillar um, right in the middle order when England really had a pretty poor start to their innings. So I think generally in those first two games, really the batsmen on both sides really showed that um, they enjoyed the conditions. What do you think to... Some of England's young players, uh, Zach Crawley, uh, Dan Lawrence, and and the opener, the new opener, Lees. What do you think to their performances? Uh, Alex Lees, I, I I have got time for Alex Lees. I look I look like the way he played in the in the Test matches. I think just lack of experience at this stage is why he didn't go on to get scores. But he 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 he's someone I think that you need to invest in and work with. Um, he looked pretty calm at the crease. Temperament was good. You know, he concentrated well. Um, you know, in time, you know, he would learn how to, you know, how to increase the tempo, etc. But the signs for him were very good um, and, and should be persevered with. Zach Crawley, as we know, is a very talented player. I don't think he's an opening batsman. Um, you know, he, he plays a little bit too many shots doesn't leave as many balls as we want it to leave. So, you know, the chances are that at times with a brand new ball, hard pitch and more bounce, you know, that he's going to get dismissed 
um, quite cheaply. But, you know, he's got talent. Uh, maybe you need to find a place for him um, somewhere else in, in, in the batting order. I don't think he's an opening batsman, but he's had to do the job here. Um, Lawrence, I thought Lawrence played well in Barbados. Um, again, I think he has got some technical um, deficiencies that he would need to work on at Test cricket because they will get exposed um, as his career unfolds. He likes to drive a lot on the up, um, where you know he's not quite to the pitch of the ball. And as you saw, when a hundred was there for the taking. Um, with one ball remaining in the day's play. Um, he held up the cover, doing just that, driving on the up. Um, and, you know, it was out, for, out in the 90s. So, you know, so he, had a, he has a bit of promise. But again, um, I wouldn't expect that he's going to be an overnight success in, in Test cricket. I think that's going to have to be a work in progress. I think Saji Mahmood definitely was a find. Um, there's no question about that. He really shouldered most of the fast bowling, really. Um, the ball with good pace, good control. Um, was the best of the bowlers with the, with the old ball in particular. Um, and then obviously, you know, he, he batted in that partnership with, with Leach to, to, to get England a, a total in that first inning. So a fine, definitely, I think he was a fine. England's lack of Quality spin, I think, was showing up again. Uh, you know, Leach toiled manfully, but not really a match-winning spinner. Um, so I think all in all, you know, England have got some things to work with, but the biggest problem right now really is to find um, number two and number three. I, I, I don't think Joe Root, even though he has indicated that he wants to bat at number three, I don't feel he really is a number three because his records, his figures at three are not, they're, they're not very flattering. Um, his success has come at four. I think England have to find a number three. Maybe you put Crowley there. I don't know. But I think Root needs to go back to four because he's such a valuable player to the batting lineup that three with a hard and no ball. And he goes early. I think it has a ripple effect on the team. So I think they need to find two and three um, in their batting order. That's interesting. Um, going back to some of those points, are, are Wokes and Overton not overseas bowlers? Well, you may listen in to my um, one, the last one I did with you. I did say it and I'll say it again. I do not believe that Chris Wokes. Um, is a good overseas bowler in the Caribbean. I have seen Chris Watts bowl in the Caribbean on several tours, and he he basically is a liability. He does not have he doesn't have enough pace. Um, the length that he bowls, he's fine bowler in in England, and I and I would be happy to play him in England. But I think a place like the Caribbean, I felt Walk should not have made this trip. I guess his selection was based on the fact that the belief that his lower order batting would be an asset to the team. It probably would have been, but for me, the main reason he's being picked is the ball. And I don't think he's a good enough bowler in these conditions in the Caribbean um, to really um, trouble um, test players and, and really should not. I don't think he should have made the trip. I think Chris Paul should have made the trip instead. Stuart Bowling, sorry. Yeah, I'm sure Chris would have liked to have gone out there and bowled. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but he got to uh, five wickets at 48. Uh, and also with, with Ben Stokes, do you, do you sometimes feel that he, he bowled well? He got seven wickets at 26, but is he over bowled sometimes? He's often given this role as the enforcer all the time. Well, on this particular tour, Stokes had to bowl because the wickets were so flat that. You know, you had to use as many bowlers as possible. In one game, you you had Leach balls about 70 overs in an innings. So, you know, if that's going to happen, Stokes is going to have to bowl because the wicket, two wickets were so flat. 
Um, so soon after his comeback, um, it probably was too much. But, you know, he, he, he put in a big effort. He always looked as if he was um, going to create something. Um, but obviously, because England's other bowlers were not producing the goods, it meant that he had to step in more often than perhaps he needed to. But that also would have been the case because of the loss of Mark Wood. I think that was a huge loss um, to the England bowling unit um, that you are the fastest bowler and the fastest bowler on both sides. Um, you know, couldn't really take part after that first test match. And going back to Jack Leach, um, he bowled 100, 189 overs, 80 maidens, but does he lack the variety to be a truly top line test spin bowler? Not just the variety. I mean, he, he's not a spinner of the ball. You know, he, he, he just, you know, his thing is about just trying to bowl tight. I mean, you can't, he's not an attacking bowler. Um, so really, you know, he'll pick up twos and threes, but he's not going to be a consistent 5-4 bowler. I mean, you know, if you think back in terms of spin bowlers, you know, Panasar, Tafnil, Edmonds, you know, they were attacking left arm orthodox bowlers. They attack the batsman. Um, at times, they go for runs, but they'll get you five wickets, they'll get you six wickets, etc. I cannot see Leach doing that. Not even if, not even if the pitch is turning. Um, you know, he he's just really a steady Eddie, and, and England really need to find some decent spin options. I think um, Dan Lawrence was on the ball. I think on this uh, on this tour because he 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 bowled quite well actually. I mean, he did actually turn the ball. And I thought he was on the ball. He was used as a, you know, a bit of a last resort. Then, you know, when he should have been used as, you know, a frontline bowler. And, um, you know, he can develop. So I think he's someone you can work on um, with his off spin. Uh, I thought he had, and he showed a bit of talent with the ball as well. Well, Mike Atherton thought that... Um... Parkinson should have been given a go as the leg spinner, certainly in the first two tests. Well, he might have been right. Um, if they'd played Parkinson, um, then Leach would have been the one to go. But obviously, Root and his colleagues decided to go for the steady Eddie instead of um, you know a leg spinner who may be expensive but could get you five or six wickets. They chose to go for control. And... Um, I thought that was a mistake um, to go for the control. Um, you would have been better, as you said, to a ball play Parkinson um, in the first test match. Um, you could always change things later on, but you know, to, to maintain the same system right throughout the, um, the tour was, I think, is what is pretty much what Joe Root's captaincy is about. Really, it's about being steady. It's not about being flamboyant. And, and taking chances. So hence, you know, Leach would, would get the nod because Leach fits into the type of thinking that, that, that goes around the team right now. Well, talking about Joe Root's captaincy, there's been a lot of talk about that since the 10-wicket ten, ten defeat in Grenada. He's been captain now for 64 tests. We record 27 wins as captain. But what are your thoughts? Do you think he should continue in the role? Well, he's, he's got 27 wins, but he's got just as many defeats. So he's the, the English captains with the highest number of wins and the English captains with the, the highest number of defeats. So, you know, that tells you really a lot about his tenure. Um, I love Joe Root as a batsman. I, I think he's an excellent player. As a captain, I, I, I really don't feel that he's an inspirational captain. Um, you know, he's had five years in the job. I think right now probably is the time for him um, to, to acknowledge that, you know, he's not improving and he's not going to improve um, the fact that on his captaincy, he's won one test match in the last 17. I don't think anybody should have to tell me I have to go. 
uh, with that sort of record, I think I would have been making that decision myself that um, as much as I love this job and believe that I can do it, um, the job doesn't love me and I can't get the job done. So I would have been looking to hand over to someone else who might be able to get the job done or, or, or may struggle, but cannot be um, any worse a situation than we're in right now. I mean, when is enough going to be enough? Well, there's been several people mentioned in the press. Uh, we've gone from Sam Billings, uh, James Vince, Ben Stokes, Josh Butler, Stuart Broad. Who would you go for? I think the obvious choice um, would be Ben Stokes. Um, you know, people are thinking at this time that Ben Stokes doesn't want it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I think what you should do is, you know, Ben Stokes, your country needs you right now. You may not want to do this job at this point in time, but it's not off, not all the time that you get things your way. You know, your country needs you. You need to step up and represent your country. Take the job as captain. Um, you can look at your rules, you know, within the team. Is it going to be one of a batting or rounder or bowling or rounder? If you choose batting, then make sure that you have got enough bowlers um, in the side to get the job done, whereby you don't have to do a great deal of of bowling. But, you know, take on the challenge. And what about um, the next England coach? There's a, a lot of talk about um, Justin Langer being a strong candidate for the test role. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I think right now they need um, someone who is, I think, well-respected. Um, someone who has been successful because that's what you're trying to, to achieve. You're trying to achieve success. So you need someone who knows what success is about. Um, you need someone who perhaps have had to, you know, build a team to achieve that success, not inherited the success. Uh, so the likes of Langer and, and Gary Kirsten, I think must be two persons who I guess would figure very highly on your list of candidates. And I don't think if you get either of those two at this moment in time that, you know, you would go far wrong. I'm not saying that they're going to come in and be a magician and suddenly you're going to reverse um, your situation and win the next 18 test matches. What I'm saying is that, you know, you, these are two people who will come in and put a process in place, um, you know, to get you back on a firm footing um, going forward, it may not be immediate, but you know, if you stick with it, you know, they'll get you there. So, I would say that those two would be the front runner at this time. It may also be a very good idea at this point to separate coaches for the different formats of the game. Um, I, I have no difficulty in Collingwood continuing as the white ball coach. But I think the test needs a separation. And do you think that um, Stuart Broad and Jimmy Anderson will be back in the summer? Right, most definitely. I mean, it, once you're playing in England, those two must figure in any discussion. Whether they be an automatic choice, I don't know. I think the the ones from this tour would be, you know, Sajid Mahmood, I think, would... Uh, would definitely start if you're picking a side in England because he's what he's done here and the future and also in conditions that he will be um, more or fair with in these conditions. I thought he did well in these conditions here, which were foreign to him. So he would get a start. Would if fit, obviously would come into the side. So Broad and Anderson would de definitely have a chance. Um, the disappointment for me here was. The situation with Robinson because nobody really knew what was going on. I mean, was he unfit and injured before he came here? Because to to sat out the whole series, um, you know, it would have been better if he if he was either left behind or or was, or was sent home because he really had no 
no part at all to play in the entire series. And and Jofra is expected to play some white ball cricket this summer, I think. Well, I mean, that's what England need. Really. They need to get Jofra back um, in the team with Mark Wood just to give them that um, that cutting edge. You know, if you're going to win test matches, um, test matches are not won by batsmen. Test matches are won by good bowlers, good fast bowlers win test matches. And England need to have Wood and Archer in operation. Once you've got them in operation, you can fill in with all the others. You can, you can from time to time, you can fill in with Stokes, you can fill in with um, Anderson, you can fill in with Broad. You know, in England, Wokes, you know, they'll know your ball and attack looks strong and your reserves look strong at home once you've got those two up front because they will make the difference. So really, the emphasis really should be on working to get both of those fit to start back playing test cricket as, uh, as soon as is uh, reasonably possible. And when they are back, um, looked after as well? Well, you should always look after your fast bowlers, and, you know, if you look what the Australians do, I mean, they have got a number of fast bowlers, but they share the workload. You don't find there's a huge amount of difference in between the overs that Cummins, Hazelwood, start bowl, you know, because those are their premium fast bowlers. So why would they want to kill one of them? Um, it's going to affect the team at some point. So they manage the workload for all of those bowlers, England need to do the same. Uh, got to manage Archie, you've got to manage Wood, you've got to manage Stokes, because those three can be match winners for you. And what's your thoughts on the England wicketkeeper position? I would be happy to continue with uh, Fox. Um, I thought he, he, he kept very well in this series. Um, you know, he, he, he was lively, you know, his glove work was good. Um, you know, he did something that you don't see a lot of the modern day keepers do. You know, to people like Chris Wartz, he stood up to the stumps, you know. Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, he you know he batted a couple of times quite well. But for me, based on his his glove work, his attitude, you know, he, he's somebody to persevere with and, and give him a run. And turning towards the West Indies, it must have been a big boost to their Test cricket and Test cricket and ambitions to to beat England. Yeah, I mean West Indies always believe in the West Indies that they can beat England. I mean that that's that's the point. There was always a belief that they can beat England because you know they feel that their bowlers are better than English bowlers in West Indies conditions, and. They, they also believe that there's a frailty in, in English batting. So at home, they always believe that they, that they, can, they can win the series. And, and that is the case. And that is the case with the, the last three or four series. Um, if you go back to 2019, you know, the West Indies won that series quite easily. You know, and this one, there's that belief that England can, that they can beat England in the West Indies. And the West Indies bowlers were far better than the English bowlers collectively. And also, without Mark Wood, they also had the faster bowlers. Um, England really didn't have it any. I think Mamu was the quickest of the bowlers. But in Seals and um, Joseph, you know, they had two of the quicker bowlers and obviously the control of Roach. So, yeah, England, England finds it very difficult at this moment in time because of their lack of quality batsmen um, to cope with the West Indies in the West Indies. And what's what's next on the agenda for the West Indies at Test Cricket? Um, West Indies have got a very, very busy series coming up, very busy season coming up, actually. Um, in the next, the next matches are, I think they go to Holland for, for some more ODIs um, in May. Straight after that, they head to Pakistan to complete the three ODIs that they didn't complete earlier um, 
in the season. And then they've got series in the Caribbean and there's Bangladesh coming, there's New Zealand, and I think India. So there's about three or four series in the Caribbean before you get to the World Cup. So they've got a very, very busy schedule um, this summer. So, you know, that'd be good for them. Um, we've got some first class cricket continuing in May as well. So opportunity for you know West Indian players to get a lot of cricket this year. And you yourself are on a, a UK tour this summer with Desmond Haynes. What, what can you tell listeners about your own tour? Well, my tour basically is a diversity, inclusivity and equity tour. And, you know, it is really designed to discuss um, those three areas, certainly diversity, inclusivity and equity. Um, why am I doing this tour? Because I believe that with my background of being the first black player to play for England, also to have played in the Middlesex side from 1972 to 1990, that was the most diverse um, teams in the history of English county cricket and also the most successful um, makes me believe that I have something to say in relation to diversity, um, inclusivity and equity. So I really am on a mission to work with schools, clubs, um, associations, leagues, um, you know, to you know, have that type of discussion with them and really try to leave with them the fact that diversity, inclusivity and equity are assets um, to clubs and organisations. It is not a hindrance. Um, my experience proves that great success can be gained by embracing um, those elements. And, you know, that's what I want to get over to the young and old people and to organizations, to companies, et cetera, et cetera, that it's not something to be afraid of, that in actual fact, um, you'd be very pleased that you, you actually do it because um, research has shown that the most successful companies, et cetera, are the ones who are very diverse and inclusive in what they do. So, yes, I'm going to arrive in England on June 1st. I'm there until September 17th. Um, Desmond, because of his duties, he was due to come earlier with me, but because of his duties as um, Chief Selector for West Indies, and as I just outlined the amount of tours, etc., that they have got this year, um, his time will be limited. Um, he was due to come the end of August, but he's just informed me that we can't really get there until September 5th. So he will come at the back end of, uh, of the tour. But again, um, you know, he will have a lot to discuss in terms of, you know, how he developed, where he came from to where he is. And um, mustn't forget that he's now the right honourable um, Desmond Haynes. So, yes, looking forward to the tour. So can clubs and organisations um, contact you to arrange bookings? Yes, I have. Um, there's a, a company, Intune Entertainment, um, Sean Belugi, who is actually looking after the, the bookings and the schedule. Um, the flyer that we send out um, has his contact details on the end, on the, on the bottom of it. But yes, we want clubs and schools really to you know to book to book us for their events. Um, we're also obviously looking to do you know, coaching and the question and answers and dinners, etc. So all the things that take place in an English summer, um, you know, we are available um, to do. Well, um, it's a very important area, I think, uh, Roland, to uh, to actually pursue. I mean, we've had an England cricket team you know, in the last couple of years where I think nine of the 11 players all went to... Uh, to private school, which is not really driving diversity and inclusion. Not at all. Um, you know, and obviously there, there are probably reasons for that, but 
you know, I think certainly um, the, the Azim Rafiq unfortunate situation has now given us, and when I say us, I mean all people involved with cricket, has now given us the opportunity to really look very closely at this whole area of diversity and come up really with concrete plans um, in all everything that we do, whether it is in playing, whether it's in coaching, whether it's in management, whether it's in committee, um, to, to have this diversity in all of those things because it will be for the betterment of your organization. It will not be a hindrance um, to your organization. So let's all embrace that. Well, the very best of luck to your uh, summer tour of the UK. And thank you again for joining me to review England's Red Bull cricket. Uh, it can only get better. Well, it's a great pleasure again, Stephen, as normal. I'm always happy to, to have a chat. Um, I will watch with interest um, what England actually do in relation um, to their Red Bull cricket. Um, right now, they're like West Indies down the bottom of the ladder. I'm pretty sure that's not where they want to be and will do all they can to try and move away from that area. But I will be certainly watching and while I'm in England, obviously, I will get a very close-up view of what is happening um, to bring English cricket forward. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pav. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. Ah, feel the whoa with Listerine at BJ's. You can save $2.50 now on Listerine products like Total Care Anti-Cavity Fluoride Fresh Mint Mouthwash or Cool Mint Pocket Packs Fresh Breath Strips at your nearest BJ's location. Experience the feeling of a million germs zapped in seconds with Listerine. Discount available through December 24th. Save now only at BJ's.